what do Simon Le Bon, Paul McCartney, and Harry Styles all have in common, you may ask? Well, I'll tell you. They're British. Today, we will be covering the three waves of British invasions. All right. Prologue. The grass is always greener across the pond. Anglophilia is a word we use to describe the infatuation with Britain and England. So I think it's something that's truly ingrained in American culture because, um, you know, if something's Euro European, it's cool, it's sexy, it's fun, it's fresh. And it's kind of the opposite way for British years in the 1960s. America is the new superpower, it's poppin', it's where we want to be. Um, so they're going to take elements of American culture and they're going to put it into their own, specifically rock and roll. And we're going to give it back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And that's going to create a cultural exchange, which is going to create some of the best music on demand. <clears throat> Chapter 1. The war is over. Life is so good. Hey, I think I'm going to make music about this. So, American culture floods British society, and rock and roll takes a chokehold on British youth, and they start buying instruments, and they're going to make what is basically like a country bluegrass garage band called a skiffle band. But the thing that's special about a skiffle band is it's cheap. It's cheap to make. You use you know, washboards, jugboards, uh, washboards, jugs, stuff like that. Um, until they can afford regular instruments. So I'm, now I'm going to tell you like a quick little story about um, some skiffle bands. So this guy, John Lennon, he's playing his guitar and he meets this guy, Paul McCartney. I don't know if you've heard of them. Um, and you know, they join this band and then all of a sudden, his friend George Harrison, Paul McCartney's friend says, please, can I be in your skiffle band? I want to be the quarryman, okay? And so he lets him join. And then they meet this other guy, Stuart Silcliffe, and they start. he starts playing drums for them. But Stuart couldn't hang, so he's not going to stick around. And we're going to get this guy, Pete Best, and he's going to join. And that's the story of one skill man. And you know what? These people have no significance whatsoever. Don't worry about them ever again, because we're moving on to chapter two. Just kidding. Part two. I lied. Johnny, Polly, Georgie, Petey, Stu, Ringu, and Andu. This is the story of the Beatles. This is the story of the Beatles, and they're low-key, high-key, gonna change the course of music history as we know it. So buckle your seatbelts. So the Beatles set the scene around 1960 and long story short they um meet this guy while they're playing shows in Hamburg and they're gonna meet this guy Brian Epstein. And Brian is like I'm gonna be your manager. So they let him be their manager and then their manager Epstein is gonna talk to George Martin who's a producer at EMI record label. He's like, George! Epstein. He's like, George, please, please, please record my Beatles. I promise they'll be done. And George Martin goes, okay. And so he records them at EMI Records. But here's the thing. George Martin is not vibing with Pete Best. He's like, this guy, gotta go. Can't handle him. So he's gonna invite this other guy, Ringo Starr, to be in the Beatles with them. But, you know, Mr. Martin is still not freaking satisfied with Ringo Starr. He's like, okay, here you go, here's the tambourine, get out of here. And he's going to have um, Andrew White join them. And they're going to record two songs, um, Let Me Let Me Do, Please Please Me, and P.S. I Love You. And Mr. Martin famously says, apparently, that's your first number one, baby. Um, after that, the Beatles have been established. Epstein and Martin are going to sign during the Pacemakers. And Decca Records, looking for something action, is going to sign Brian and the Tribbles. And that's what's happening over in Liverpool. So, chapter three, the Cameron Explosion. Um, the Cameron Explosion is a period in the Earth where um, life turns from like little specks into big like living things. And that is going to be, that's kind of what's happening in London with music. The skiffle bands are turning into these big monstrous pieces. So. Um, now that we're in London, we're gonna th we have these college kids. They're playing with blues and jazz, and we get Mick Jagger and Keith Richards in the Rolling Stones, and then we get the Kings who create stadium jams, and that's what we're gonna think of as like the big three of the um, of the invasion. Those are the big three. So that's what's happening there. And now it's time for. <laughs> and 
second mission, America and technology. So there are a couple of factors that are gonna make this like possible. So first is that um, the technology. World War II is demanding recording technology and we're gonna see lots of different recording technology. We're gonna see them, uh, we're gonna take magnetic tape from the Germans. We're gonna see new microphones like the new U-47. We're gonna see um, equalizers and black boxes and we're gonna see the birth of multi-track recording. But the real invention is magnetic tape. It is possible to now work in post. Now you don't have to do all this stuff together. Okay, is the culture of World War II. Post-World War II Americans have spare money. They're rich, things are good, things are good in America. They built the suburbs and they're sterile and they're white and they're Christian and they're boring. And so all of America instead has all this time and money and you know what they do with that money? They give it to their children, allowances. And you know what they have money to buy? They have money to buy records, duh. Um, and that is gonna come create a, oh, an atmosphere where now youth is now a big market in consumerism. Um, also, another factor is gonna be dance hall cultures. Dance halls were at their peak and this led to the lots and lots of record sales. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> wow, what a fun intermission. Now it's time for chapter four, music in 1950 to 1960. So here, I looked through the top chart and here are my observations. <sighs> The songs are valid. They're slow. They're boring. They sound like music you play in a mental institution. I don't want to listen to that crap. And, you know, I can't imagine the teens in the 50s felt any different. So, artists like Gene Autry and Perry Como are singing in this monotone, transatlantic accents with these orchestral ballads, and it's boring. Ew. But then we have this guy, Elvis, and in the charts in 1956. And we have all these songs about love. We have these songs about sex. We have these songs about rebellion. Things you've never heard of before. And we also have Buddy Holly and the Crickets. And they have drums. And they are on the top charts in 1957. And things are so much good. And we start to see a real shift in the culture towards rock and roll. Things are bad. They're calling it Satan music. It's really not that serious. But, you know, whatever. But you know what? By 1950, it's gone. Poof. All dried up. Buddy Holly, actually dead. Rock and roll, kind of dead. The top charts are all of a sudden replaced with doo-wop and country ballads and more transatlantic pop garbage. Ew! Anyways. So by the time we hit 1963, the music industry is ready for a change. Things are so boring, the world is ready for the Beatles. Chapter 5, Beatlemania. So, um, Epstein, their manager, is trying to find them a record deal and like I said earlier, Decca rejects them. No Beatle album here. Um, the next thing, ooh, sorry. They are, they're signed with EMI, the George Martins. They're putting out songs in February of 1963. They drop an LP a month later. Boom, number one in the UK. They drop some more singles. Boom, number one in the UK. And, you know, so EMI, backstory, EMI is partially owned by Capitol Records. And they, are refusing to release the Beatles albums in the U.S. despite how well they're doing in other parts of the U.K. in the parts of the U.K. So they make a deal with this inner independent music company called B.J. and they work out that they're going to do it under this label and they're going to have a self titled album called Introducing the Beatles and it's going to be so much fun. Except for that doesn't happen yet because there's a bunch of red tape, things aren't going to be pushed through, and it's a disaster. Anyway, so Epstein is fed, excuse my language, the fuck up. He's fed the fuck up. He's like, whatever. So he takes a demo to, uh, I want to hold your hand, to Brown Meggs, who is some like big wig at Capitol Records. And he's like, oh my God, listen to the Beatles, please. And Brown Meggs goes, okay. And so he um, is going to like give them money. And he gives them $40,000 for marketing campaign. And he signs off on making them an album. Um, so then we have BJ and Capitol Records releasing two different similarly titled albums called The Beatles or whatever and the, that year five Beatles, five Beatles songs from the top start to that year. They are number one and two in the charts and teenage, teenage girls are no joke, no haha -ha funny, actually pissing their pants because they are so excited to see The Beatles. That is what Beatlemania is. Anyways, so piggybacking off of Beatlemania, we have chapter six, everyone else. So, you know, after the Beatlemania starts, 
everybody wants a slice of the pie. Everybody's like, I want to be Beatlemania. So, all these people are getting record deals and they're going to the U.S. and everybody wants it. So we start to see Jerry and the Pacemakers on the top cards in 1964. The next year we're seeing even more and more. We see the Beatles, the Stones, Herman and the Herbits, the Yardbirds, Freddy and the Dreamers, Kinks, Kinks, the Animals. And by 1965, which is like the peak of the invasion, it's the peak of Beatlemania. But then a year later, 1966, the top 10 were all American artists. So what happened? Where did Beatlemania go? Chapter 7, The Summer of Love. So The Summer of Love is like a music festival that happens in California in the summer of 1967, but that's really not what this is about. So it's more of the vibes. So in 1966, and the Beatles are like, mm, we're done touring, we're no longer the Beatles. See you later, Captain. And so they, after their last tour, unannounced to anybody, stop touring, they're done. And then, they released their final album, album, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club, in the summer of 1967, and that's kind of like the last hurrah of the British invasion. They're not, things are not like going anymore. Free love is over. Things are bad. The Vietnam War is kicking. People are upset. But you know what? That's not the last we're going to see of the British invasion. But um, the impact of the first British invasion is basically what started it, as how Elvis started it for the Beatles and the Stones. The Beatles and the Stones are going to inspire the next generation of music. And we're going to see a whole bunch of garage bands start popping up everywhere. Intermission, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club and why you should care. Can you state your name? Charlotte. Do you know who the Beatles are? No. Do you know who the Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club is? No. So as the story goes, the Beatles are flying back from their last tour, and Mr. Paul McCartney is fed the fuck up of being a Beatle. He's done. He's like, I'm done being a Beatle. Okay. And so he's messing with these salt and pepper packets. And some guy's like, oh my God, Sergeant Pepper. And he's like, oh my God, no way. And then he's like, oh my God, Sergeant Pepper's Lily Hearts Club. We're going to do that. Also, at some point in the story, they hear pet sounds by the Beach Boys, who's an American rock group. And they're like, oh my God, not for real. And they love it. And they're like, we're going to do this, but more beatly. So that's what they do. They, they try. They make it even better. Okay, do you understand? Okay, all right. And the next thing that they're going to do is they're gonna go to this guy, Jeff Emmerich, and they're gonna say, you need to make me this album, and it's gonna be super hard. And he's like, okay. So this is the very early stages of multi-track recording, and apparently they only had a four-track machine, which doesn't really make sense to me because there, there was multi-track recording, like, um, like a track, but I guess for some freaking reason they didn't have it, but whatever. Anyways, so they're gonna have to basically um, blend this stuff together. So essentially, imagine you had two track, you had eight tracks, and you're trying to condense it down to four. So you have to put two on each one, but every time you transfer over the music, it loses a little bit of sound. So um, Mr. Emmerich is gonna have to sit down and plan out this stuff, and it's gonna be so hard. Also, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club is a 40 minute long album. And you know how long it took? It took over 700 hours. Over 700 hours of work. That's 17 hours per minute of listening time. That is insane. Also, the other reason you should care about Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club is it created the idea of a concept album. You know, this is like the first time people are seeing a concept album. It's not like a collection of songs. It's a story. It's telling a story. Also, I would like to add that Strawberry Fields Forever was supposed to be on this album, and it used a synthesizer called a Millitron, which is pretty revolutionary for the time and place. And that's why you should care about Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club. Back to you. Wow, what a lovely message from our sponsors. Continuing. Chapter 8, The In Between. So, the first part of reading the is over, but that does not mean that England is not a musical hub, okay? It is a musical hub. Things are happening. So, I'm going to quickly cover, like, what's happening in the 70s in England to try to get through um, to our next wave. So, the first thing we have is Glam Rock. It's kind of rise by clothing, glitter, platform shows, platform clothes, androgynous and feminine fashion, and we have David Bowie. I think you know who David Bowie is, but he didn't pioneer glam rock. He just made it popular, um, starting with 1969 with Space Oddity. He also uses the idea of this concept album when he creates a character called Ziggy Stardust. 
Um, also, I'm going to throw queen into Glam Rock. Queen. Okay. Next, in New York City, we're getting the first pump scene. We got the Ramones. Okay. And then, in the UK, we have a different pump scene. We have the Clash, the Sex Pistols, um, the Buzz Clocks. You know what? And this is a backlash to the free loves, hippie bullcrap that was happening in the 60s. We're done with it. Next, we have metal. Metal started because England's post-economic war state, turns out, doesn't last forever. Things are getting bad again. This music is for disenfranchised youth who are staring at a long life in a factory, okay? And we have, it's psychedelic, it's industrious, it's loud. And we have bands like um, Black Sabbath, and if you remember the Yardbirds from earlier, they're gonna disband and create a new band. And you know what that name is called? Led Zeppelin! And this is like one of the, this is probably the most popular band of the entire 70s, okay? Then we have Psychedelic Rock. We have Pink Floyd. Pink Floyd is going to, again, use this concept album. They're going to show their technology. They're going to show technology. And they're going to popularize the idea of sampling even more than Mr. Beatles. Okay? Also, real quick, some of these technology we're going to see eight track recording become in even more accessible. We're going to see cassette tapes. We're going to see eight tracks slowly start to replace vinyl records. Which brings us to... Chapter 9, what the fuck is New Wave? Um, so this question was shockingly difficult for me to answer. And you know, you'd think you'd be able to read like one Wikipedia page, but no. <sighs> Background, 1970s, we're seeing lots of innovations. And we're gonna start seeing the synthesizers show up in around 1965. Maybe we're gonna start to mess around with electronic music. Like I said earlier, Mellotron with the Beatles, we're seeing Synthesizers with Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon. We're seeing Joy Division, which will later become the iconic new wave band, New Order, and we're gonna see Roxy Music. And since it's gonna become more affordable, so it's gonna become more simple, more people are gonna have it in their space to record with. Um, so new wave is gonna begin in the American punk scene with bands like the Talking Heads and Blondie. And then when we get to the new wave that you're thinking of right now in your head. It's going to start in the UK punk scene as it tends to mix punk rock and pop and disco and put it all together into this delicious little sound. Um, the first genre defining artist is probably Gary Newman with this robotic um, music. It's kind of the first time of the invasion. It's Gary Newman's Cars. It landed number nine in the US charts of 1980. And also, new technologies such as the Walkman and the cassettes are going to set up a highly musically talented decade. So, buckle up. Chapter 10, MTV. So, I have just established earlier what new wave is and here, how do we get here? Then there's MTV. MTV is now filled with reruns of Ridiculousness and Teen Mom, but at one point in time, apparently I had music videos, I asked my mom. So, basically, MTV um, is pitched as it's gonna be radio pictures. They're like, mm, that's lame, we want music videos. But there's a problem. There's a problem. No one makes music videos except for people in the UK because they have something called video jukeboxes, but no one in America sees the value of music videos. So MTV starts with 250 music videos on a 24 hour channel. You do the math. That's a lot of repetition for a long time before people have time to make new music videos. Okay. And the first song we're going to play is Video Kill the Radio Star by The Buggles, which is an English band as well. Um, and that's going to kind of start off the new wave movement. Um, we're going to see lots of bands like the Human League, Soft Cells, Tears, Fierce, Police, Depeche Mode. And with the rise of MT, we're going to see multiple, we're also going to see a lot of one-hit wonders with cool music videos like my personal favorite, Block of Seagulls, I Reigns of Our Way, we're going to see The Vapors, we're going to see I Met With You, Modern English, um, and we're going to see these absolutely iconic 80s bands who Americans will never hear of, hear of ever again. Um, next. Um, by 1982, we can see that the Billboard sales of the top 100, we can see that MTV is starting to influence record sales because we have these obscure, like, post-punk bands making their way onto the US top charts. And there's one band who sticks out more than all the rest, and that band is going to be Duran Duran. So Duran Duran is from Birmingham, um, England, in 1978, and they're kind of for sex as these raunchy music videos. They're gonna put out girls on film and it's gonna have topless girls. It's gonna have sumo wrestlers. It's gonna have people in fun costumes. It's gonna be flashy. There's gonna be pillow fights. 
And that combination with the reputation that is coming on MTV, they're going to become one of the most popular bands during the 80s, and they're going to have a Beatle-like success. People are going to go crazy, crazy for them. Princess Diana even called them once her favorite band. Also, we have The Culture Club, which is a new wave band from London. They're going to use reggae styles of music. And their lead singer is going to be Boy George, and he's going to be a cultural icon for this era. And their best song for the song, Karma, 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 Karma Chameleon. Anyways. Um, so the peak of New Wave is 1983, and then by 1978, or sorry, 1980, the peak is going to be 1983. By 1987, it's gone. Just as fast as it came and went, it's gone. And you might be wondering why that is, but I'm going to tell you. American video killed the British radio star. Basically, Michael Jackson, Madonna, Prince, they did it better. So there's no need for um, spending all this money and porting all this other stuff and watching it. So all these American videos are going to take up all of the airtime and there's not going to be any left for a new wave. But it did leave a lasting mark. I think when most people think of 80s music, they're thinking of some kind of this like club culture like song. And that brings me to my next intermission, CDs. CDs. So here's what's going to happen with CDs. First compact disc is created in 1982. And guess what? It's freaking expensive. But you know what? By 1988, more technology is going to advance and they're going to become cheaper. And then they're going to start to slowly replace vinyls. And then eventually in 1991, they're going to replace the cassette. And you know what? You know what else is happening in the 90s? The internet. The internet's invented. And you know what happens with the internet? People can pirate stuff. Okay? Music is now way more accessible, way cheaper to a wider audience. And people are going to get into subcultures. That's it. <laughs> Wow, what a lovely message from our sponsors. Check 12, Spice World. So, here's what's gonna happen with that. The next time we see a British, massive British success, the Spice World. It's 1990, boy bands are all the rage. Everybody's loving a boy band. We got Oasis, Blur, Insane, Boys Men, Backstreet Boys. So in 1994, these guys, Bob and Chris, father and son, Bob and Chris Herbert, they're gonna put it out of the newspaper and they're gonna say, girl group wanted. 400 girls are going to show up, and out of them, we're going to pick five. And those are going to be Ginger, Sporty, Posh, Spice, Baby. I think I missed one. Ginger, Posh, Sporty, Spice, Baby, Scary, whatever. The Spice Girls. You know who. Um, then we're going to have, um, they're going to release their first single in July of 1996. And it's going to be Wannabe. And they're going to get all the way up to the number 11 spot on the U.S. top charts with their first single. And that is gonna break the Beatles record for highest ranking non-American album of their, like with their first single. Basically the first thing they put out ranked higher than the Beatles first thing that they put out, which is kind of cool because they're girl boss. Um, so November of 1996, we're gonna get what we call Spice Mania. And they're gonna start selling out, selling bunches of records. And they're gonna be the best selling British act since the Beatles. And just two years after that, Ginger Spice quits. She's gone. She can't hang anymore. And that is going to be kind of what puts an end to Spice Mania. Um, in 2001, they're going to officially break up or permanent hiatus or whatever. And that is what's going to put a cap on um, Spice Mania. But don't worry. There's more to come. Chapter 12. Um, chapter 13. Hello, love. This is the final boss level. So, 2011. Do you know what happens? Kate Middleton and Prince William get married. They're getting married. And then, you know what? It's a big deal. Americans love when stuff like this happens. And because of that marriage, there's an interest in British culture. And this is when we get a bunch of new musical acts hanging scenes in the early 2010s. We get Ed Sheeran, we get Jesse J, we get Sam Smith, we get Elle Goulding. And we get, most importantly, one direction um so 2010 they're going to be on this game show called the x factor which is basically american bear style and we'll get liam payne now horn zayn malik blues thompson and ari styles um and they're 
I'm gonna pick the name One Direction, and they're not gonna win X Factor, but that's okay, because while they're on the show, you're getting a massive following of teenage girls. A massive following. Absolutely astronomical. Okay, and so Simon Cowell is gonna say, here's a record deal. Here you go. And they're gonna get a record deal. And then you know what happens? They're gonna get even more famous, duh! Um, so, One Direction is the first boy, boy band to be in the prime of the internet. This is back when YouTube was full of cat videos and Twitter was fun, okay? And they're gonna get so many fans. All their fans are gonna make Tumblr, they're gonna make Instagram, they're gonna make Facebook, they're gonna make, they're gonna write fanfic, okay? And all this fanfic and all these fan pages is basically gonna create Stan Twitter, which I think is kinda cool. But yeah, so they're just, they're getting, they're posting their blog and they're making fans. And this is like, this is Beatlemania times a million and five. Like they are, they feel like they actually know them because they're getting this like so parasocial relationship with them. And that is all gonna come crashing down in 2015 when the bad boy of the group, Zayn Malik leaves. He can't hang anymore. He's gone to focus on his um, solo career, but guess what? That didn't really work out because the only one with a notable, really a notable career is Harry Styles. And he's become something of a cultural icon. And that concludes the final British invasion. But you know what? I think today we need to go over some key takeaways. Conclusion. Who run the world? Girls. <laughs> so, hi. I think it's time we go over when, what we went over today. What did we learn? I know what I learned. I think we need to realize that the real common denominator is not that they're British, but that their main fan base was teenage girls. And a lot of times people like to hate on teenage girls for living, breathing, drinking drinks, and you know, going about their daily life. But I think we need to acknowledge that one, once upon a time, teenage girls were the main fan base of the most popular of the most influential band of all time, the Beatles. So maybe if I write a Harry Styles fanfic, don't make fun of me. Maybe just appreciate it as a piece of its time. Bye, love. Hey. I'm gonna stop it. Play me. I'll play that at the end. Yeah. yeah. I, have to, I have to re record that though, because that was bad. Okay.